Okay, we're pretty much live, but I'm gonna wait till the screen shows up and then we'll start. There we go, we're live. Hey, good to see hey. you. You too. I think that a lot of people are excited to, to hear this and to, to get a feel for, you know, what you have to share with them, frankly. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the things that you've learned over the years um, with us and on your own, and just kind of your story, you know, when you were younger, how you learned certain things, I think it will be really cool for people to hear. Um, one thing I want people to, to notice is that um, there's a certain sense of self-awareness that Michael has developed over, over the years. And with the training, it's been magnified. And this self-awareness um, is, if not one of the most important states, very important states. Because think about it, right? In our training, we talk of consciousness and we talk of how one must become aware of what's going on. The more consciousness you have, the more conscious you become, the easier it is for you to actually be more in control of your environment. Now, there are certain things in life that happen. Sometimes you're like, oh, I don't like that, or I don't like this. When things happen, it's actually when things go unconscious. And it, it's things have gone unconscious for a while, then physical events begin to show up even that gets your attention and it's like, whoa, you gotta pay attention. It's almost like, you know, your world is telling you, hey, you gotta really, you know, take the feedback. And what's cool about what you're gonna learn from, you know, this interview and, and listening to Michael, um, you'll find that there's a certain way to develop this, this uh, self-awareness. And as you go through the training, you'll be able to also take some of his um, learnings and, and apply it to your way of learning from our training. And you'll find great self-awareness, which will bring you um, a lot of peace, I would say, a lot of peace. And um, let's get going. Michael, welcome today. Thank you for joining us. And I, I'm excited not only to introduce you to our group um, officially, um, but also to, I mean, people know that you're our in-house coach right now and our business development um, team member. And it's very important for people to get to know you. Um, but I think why not use this opportunity to do both, right? They hear your stories, get to know you better. Meanwhile, um, get to know you. So if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and um, big picture. Yeah, tell us a little bit where you grew up, what you were passionate about growing up. And what got you here? Like, what what led you to this point in your life? Sure. Yeah, great to see you, William. I appreciate this opportunity to let people know a little more about my story, really. Um, definitely want everyone in the community to feel like I'm an open book and that you can come to me and we can have, you know, open, honest and vulnerable conversations. So uh, really appreciative of this opportunity to kind of let you guys know a little more about me. Um, I know a lot of you in this group already. But for those I don't know, I look forward to meeting you and talking more with you. Um, I'm from uh, the New Hampshire area, born in Boston, grew up in the New England area. Um, you know, big picture sports, uh, competitive was a big part of my life. Um, an even bigger part of my life was martial arts. My father is a uh, martial arts self-defense teacher. He's been practicing uh, the art of Nijitsu since uh, we're going on about 35 years now. So, you know, he had me in a gi when I was about uh, six months old, throwing punches and all that other good stuff. Um, beyond, you know, the physical, what self-defense martial arts really did for me was teach me a lot of discipline. Uh, martial arts is great about that. It teaches you self-discipline. Um, and William kind of touched on it earlier, self-awareness. Um, so I do credit a lot of that self-defense training and jiu-jitsu practice to being able to intuitively kind of seek out that self-awareness within myself. Um, and as that kind of developed later on in my life, um, you know, you know, things happen, you know, stuff happens in the world. And I believe I kind of uh, went through, and if you're familiar with NLP, you know, you understand the stock filters. And I started to delete things. I started to distort things and I started to generalize things. Um, so my self-awareness really kind of went away 
I, in, in a sense, or maybe it just kind of like, uh, it went underneath a layer and I kind of shielded away from it or kind of gravitated away from it in a sense. And, um, one of the biggest things that NLP was a draw for me was learning how to reignite that passion for self-awareness again, to really get it back. Um, one of the things that I remember reading about about three or four years ago was from this man named Saad Guru. And he was talking about how, how the body and the mind, you know, we're much more than that. You know, we are much more than our bodies and our minds. I, he was talking about how, you know, our body really is made up of this heap of food that we collect from the earth and it makes our body over time, right? And I, I, I remember feeling connected to that message. And then he said even more messages where he's like, our mind is a heap of impressions, really. And all these impressions in our mind kind of dictate our thoughts and our values and our acts. And I remember feeling connected to that statement and having a bit of, okay, what does that really mean type thing? Um, and when I started to really kind of search for, you know, seek out, what does that mean? What does that mean to me really? Uh, that's when my path kind of led me to neurolinguistic programming and thankfully, um, a fortunate meeting with you, William, at a Renatus meeting, where when you talked about, you know, the map is not the territory, something sparked within me of recognizing that, hey, there's something more about being self-aware um, that I was looking for, that I was seeking for. So finding my way into the neurolinguistic program world, into the study of neuroscience, uh, how our brain really works. Uh, the intricacies of it, you know, it's become a passion, a very, very big passion over the past couple of years that I love doing. I, I love having that, that seeking out um, and, and self-awareness um, because once you become self-aware, it's really when you start to realize that as we talk about in the training, that you're a hundred percent responsible for the joy and the happiness in your life. And that gives me power. That, that's, that's freedom to me, really. I love it. I love it. That was very good. You know, this self-awareness is a central theme of, I mean, human life. When you, when you become not aware and unconscious, that's when things, you know, fall out of alignment. So a lot of times when people begin to experience, you know, things that they don't want in their life, one of the key things is not so much to look outside and say, how do I fix this? Or how do I fix that? but instead it's look inward and wonder what can I do to improve myself so I can be the person who can easily not only be aware, right, but also be able to handle this and, and resolve this. So what's wonderful um, about Michael and, and his life is that a lot of things happen in life, you know, one thing or another, um, and all the things happen only made him more self-aware, only made him more grateful and more at peace. And that's a really cool thing. Now, of course, I'm not going to say Michael's always at peace, right? And we're all human. Look, I'm, I'm not always at peace. One thing you'll find is if you begin to learn and search inward and ask yourself, you know, what have I not been aware of? You'll find that you'll begin to arrive at that state of peace that Michael's speaking of. So Michael, if you don't mind telling us a little bit more about like, what do you do when you are not feeling at peace? Like, how do you find yourself building that self-awareness, using the skills you have, and you can touch on anything you want. Um, how did you bring yourself back into a state of peace and alignment whenever things don't work the way you want? Yeah, you know, I uh, take a cold shower, really shock the neurology. <laughs> Good interrupt, state interrupt. <laughs> yeah, uh, cold showers are fantastic though, just side note. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's about shock and neurology, right? Um, that's what I like about it. So what William was just talking about. What you just said is actually really brilliant. A lot of people, when they take the training, they hear about stay interrupt and, you know, pattern interrupt. What you just told them is, hey, let's do something that will be a pattern interrupt. That you can't help but feel different when you take a cold shower. Keep going. I mean, and there are other things, so keep going. Yeah. And I, I think it's become second nature too. I kind of like to do the self interrupt to myself now, um, break state a little bit, 
So what William was talking about before, I just want to touch on uh, real quickly when we talk about finding the peace. Like when I said I'm 100%, 100% responsible, uh, I'm not Gandalf, right? I'm not some wizard. I don't control the external world. I don't have control of other human beings or anything like that. When I say I'm 100%, 100% responsible, I mean that um, you know my emotions and my reactions, those are my own. They're, I choose my map, my model of the world, you know, I get to choose my own reactions. That's a privilege I now keep to myself. So no matter what happens externally, I have this framework in my mind that is now set that everything internally is mine. No one can make me upset. I can choose to be upset. No one can make me happy. I choose to make myself happy. So no matter what happens in the external world, and that's when I was kind of joking when I said, I'm not Gandalf. I don't control, I'm 100% responsible for everything that happens around me. I am 100% responsible for my reactions to that. And it's just, a, it's now it's an honor, it's a privilege that I keep to myself to keep that peace. So no matter what's happening, really financially uh, within my, my, my roommates, um, you know, work, car crash, anything happens. It's just that I am at peace because I know my reaction determines my state of mind. So that's what I mean by that. I mean, how do you think Gandalf became Gandalf, right? was finding that that internal control that mastery inside first i mean that's just my assumption um so then tell me this what happens when something is a little bit more personal like instead of your roommate's work or someone else having a car crash i mean of course all your listeners are safe and healthy right if you're especially if you're driving you're driving safe um what happens when things are a little bit more personal and you're like oh man i really don't like this or that happening. I mean, we all have those things, right? So how do you um, not take it personally and meanwhile learn from it personally? Um, you know, it's gonna sound a little repetitive, but it's still about kind of focusing really what my mind wants and what the outcome is. And of course there's techniques we've learned in your training. I've learned the neuro-linguistic programming, uh, meta model, being able to ask questions in a certain way to expand the framework, expand the pictures, right? But let's talk a little, I guess, I guess, if something upsets you, discomforts you, gives you pain, you know, pain in the physical body, that can be a good thing. It's a reminder really that we're alive, right? Uh, what we're, I think we're focusing on though, is suffering. Suffering happens in the mind. Now we have control of whether we really choose to suffer or not. Um, and I like to remind myself of a very powerful example of a man named Viktor Frankl, uh, his life and his book, uh, his uh, Man's Search for Meeting, if you guys aren't familiar with it, I, I highly recommend it. You know, this is a man who was able to go through the Nazi concentration camps. And as he put it, not truly ever really suffer because he was able to control his thoughts within his mind. Now, it's a very um, high, powerful example. But the, it, again, it just shows that when things personally affect us to give it discomfort, suffering, suffering happens truly in the mind. So I like to look at it as I have control of my mind. I have control of this freedom of suffering because I don't want to go through life suffering. I want to go through life and I want to choose happiness, right? We all want to choose happiness. We all want to choose love or peace. We don't want to choose suffering. No one wants to choose that. So, um, you know, I, I guess another uh, definition that I'll, I'll just use real quickly is Richard Bandler's definition of freedom, where he talks about freedom is the ability to use your conscious mind to control your unconscious activity within your mind. And that's because as I've learned, our unconscious mind really just wants the path of least resistance. It wants the you know deliberately designed automated program so it can do the boring mundane tasks. So we can go off and we do the, the things that we love, the free, the creative task, right? In our life. And if you're able to use your conscious mind to control your unconscious mind to really recognize that, Hey, I, what I don't want is suffering. So if something upsets me, discomforts me any kind of way, that's what I choose to focus on that. What is this making me feel? How, how am I right now? How am I feeling with it? Um, and that's how I get over negative emotions, whether, you know, it's in a relationship or something that's happened to me really personally. Um, because again, like William said earlier, you know, you know, we're still human beings. We react. It's, it's not like we're above anything.
Yeah, and you know, that is such a great perspective to have because when you begin to think that way, other people's behavior still to us becomes kind of a, you know, like what, what NLP says, right? The person is not their behavior. And as extreme as things may be in the world right now today, right? Look at the world today and, and or, you know, what happened the other day at, on Capitol Hill. People um, do things that, yes, they may later regret. At the time, they're doing it because of their emotions. And sometimes they planned it, right? Um, but the rest of us who understand, who are aware, who are conscious, get to control how we respond. Get to control how we, because, you know, I get on social media and I see people getting really mad and I get it, right? It makes sense. Uh, meanwhile, it's okay to feel at peace even when you're not liking what's going on outside. Because when you're at peace, you have more control. You have far more control of your internal state and your behavior, then you have greater influence. So negative emotions and, and pain, right? As you said earlier, can be a good thing because they are feedback. So if we ever find ourselves not feeling excited or not feeling positive emotions, it's not to say, hey, look, I'm not a peaceful person and I don't have freedom, but we can actually look at it and say, hey, how, what can I learn from it so I can become yeah, more self-aware and learn from it. One thing you brought up that's really cool. Um, so the gentleman who wrote the book, yeah, Man's Search for Meaning, um, local therapy is actually one of the roots of time and therapy, which we teach. So one of the things that people will learn as they go through time and therapy is that they will actually learn how he, how he, yeah, Victor thought of, you know, um, how he became so aware of his internal states and how he thought of healing how he thought of the mind, you know, overcoming pain and obstacles and, and suffering and turn that into peace and freedom. So it's a very powerful, very powerful model. Um, let me ask you this then, Michael, what would you say is like the biggest learning? I know there may be a lot, but what would you say would be the biggest learning that comes to your mind right now from the trainings you've taken with us? Like, and here's, let me tell you why I asked this. As you answer this, keep in mind, these people that are listening, some of them already took the training, some of them have not. Um, what's useful is that as you answer this question, they will be like, oh, I didn't think about that. I can use that more. Or some of them are like, I haven't taken the training yet. I can actually use this. I can look forward to this when I get into the training. Um, but of course, everyone's got different learning. So what would, the, what would you say that's the one thing that really made the biggest difference since the training? Yeah. Um... Like you said, many different things. The one thing for me is kind of, I'm going to go back to the 100% responsible for our thoughts, really. Um, I guess I'll just preface this really with, you know, we sometimes think that our thoughts are bad or wrong or right or anything like that. There's no right or wrong from what I've learned. There's no good or bad. Thoughts are fantastic things, guys, you know, um, but, you know, fantastic things mishandled can sometimes hurt us. You know, a car, a car is a fantastic thing, but if you mishandle a car, it can hurt you, right? So thoughts are fantastic things. I am 100% responsible for my thoughts. And when I mean that is now I have to have this perception and I've learned this through the training of, I'm not going to from now on out, when I look at my thoughts, it goes from a problem frame to an outcome frame, from a uh, you know a failure frame to a feedback frame. So that's what being 100% uh, responsible really is, is just learning to what state am I in right now? What are my thoughts doing for me right now? And I'm not failing. I'm not suffering. What is my feedback from it? Okay. I'm just shifting from that, po that problem frame to an outcome frame. And that's, what's really helped me within the training, just being able to take the techniques we learn, um, the skills that I've learned through the trainings and, you know, just my continuous study of neurolinguistic programming and neuroscience in general, and then adapt that to, Hey, my thoughts are going to go, crazy or they're going to fly around sometimes that's okay they're, they're just thoughts and thoughts can be fantastic things if you can control them and move them into whatever frame that you're whatever state you're looking for 
Excellent. Yes. You know, that framing is key because whoever controls their frame controls their lives. So if, if you become aware of the frame, right? And in this frame, here's the thing. A lot of people um, are actually controlled by their own frames that they've built over the years or other people have helped them build. And, and they are actually called limiting beliefs and boundaries that are not helpful. Whereas when you get to control it and, and morph it into what you want, they become very useful, very useful. They become aids and support units in a sense, right? They become your environment that is very um, congruent with what you want. And the frame actually supports you in helping you get what you want. So next question I have for you then. Um, actually, I want to tell this story about um, flexibility, you know, an experience that we had together. So over the years, um, I've observed yourself, right? Obviously, I didn't bring you into this position just because, right? Um, it wasn't necessarily like I woke up with a dream and I was like, I need to hire Michael. It wasn't like that. It was, it was you know, I deliberately observed. And, and some of it wasn't so deliberate in terms of like, oh, I, I'm going to hire Michael. Therefore, I observed him. It was like, I have just observed you because I observed the people we train. And um, I found certain cool things and that through these observations i was like oh one day right i'm like oh i think that would be a perfect fit for what i'm after so i'll tell you one of the cool experiences that michael and i had we um i was in vegas one time and um i was like michael so we were at dinner i'm like hey want to go to malibu tomorrow he's like yeah and uh, I was like, for how long? Like just the day, right? We'll come back in the afternoon. He's like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> and of course I gave him some details. I'm like, hey, you know, we're gonna go look at this home. Um, Cause I was contemplating poss the possibility of moving to California at the time. And, or, you know, still interested in purchasing property there. But anyway, I was, I was like, hey, Michael, you wanna come and look at this house with me? And he's like, yeah. Um, he's like, what kind of house? I'm like, let me show you some pictures. And it's a $20 million home out in Malibu. And uh, I tend to do things like that, right? To, to take myself to different neurologies that I enjoy. And, you know, at the time I was like, I do, I really want something like this. Um, I wanted to expose myself to different styles of things. Yeah. Because remember, if you're in our training, we always ask you to write things that you want and experiences that you want. Right. So to me, I want to be front home. It's one of the things. So I wanted to go tour it. Right. And of course, I happen to have gotten a private invitation. So I'm like, Michael, come with me. Long story short, we got to Malibu. He's like, so why am I here? I mean, that those weren't exactly the words you said, but like that was like the sentiment. Right. So I'm like, well, OK, you're my friend and I want you to display your flexibility. Yeah. I want you to imagine as if you have $200 million yourself and you're just here as a friend, as my friend to support me, to make sure that I mix why, make wise investment decisions when I purchase a home, yeah? So you're here to, to give me second opinion and things like that. Can you act accordingly? You're like, all right, I can do it. And not only did he do it, he did it so well that all the people in the party wanted to talk to Michael. And, and find out what he was all about. Who's this mysterious friend? Yeah, who's this mysterious person? And nobody even talked to me. People didn't even care to talk to me. People wanted to get to know Michael, right? They were like, who is this guy? This mysterious gentleman, right? Who's just full of energy and, and yet so quiet and at peace. And so that was a really cool observation, that I think, cool experience for me to watch because instantly he took on that neurology, right? Now I'm gonna ask you guys, the audience, imagine for a moment that you too also have $200 million. How would you act? Imagine not just having it, but you're the person who earned it, who created it, right? Or maybe you already have, right? But then pick a bigger number. Now some of you have, some of you in the audience have done that number. So pick maybe 2 billion, 20 billion, yeah? A number that you're like, oh no, that's, that's big, yeah? Pick something like that and ask yourself, what, what, do I, what do I 
need to think about myself. How am I going to perceive myself? Yeah, you ask all the questions you ask. I want you to think about that. Yeah, imagine really that you have this amount because you've created it. Now, how would you act? Now, I know this may be, you know, touching on psychosepinetics, like, you know, a popular movement and, and a school of thought in the 80s and 90s, still very relevant, right? Because it teaches you your identity dictates your behavior, therefore your outcome. It's very true, yeah? So at that moment, Michael displayed that instant ability to tap into the identity. Now, some of you in the audience, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to ask Michael some more questions. Some of you in the audience have said to me before, and I've heard this, yeah, and many of you actually have said this, imposter syndrome. Anyone ever felt that? Some of you probably have felt that, right? Hey, look, I've even wondered, yeah, what is, what is this feeling, right? And hey, look, I've been there. So I'm going to ask you guys, what is the difference between the imposter versus someone who's flexible? in being able to take on the neurology of a future self, the person that you will be, the person that you're creating, yeah, yourself, right? Because look, your body renews, your neurology renews, every one of us renews and progress. As old cells die off, new cells, right? Along with it, new ideas and new thoughts and your new experiences, along with, hey, watching trainings like this, attending our training, right? Some of you signed up, or you know, are signing up for our training. These new ideas that will come to you during the training, what will they do, right? They will transform the way we think. So what would happen when you begin to think and identify as that person and begin to act that way, even when you don't have, let's say 200 million or $2 billion, are you truly an imposter or are you someone who's creating your future? See, the thing is, society never taught us what, how to identify the difference between the two. So, Michael, what do you think the difference is? Can you tell the audience like what your thoughts are? And I'll perhaps add to it. Um, so my thoughts on that kind of go back to one of the prep uh, or the, the uh, I don't know, like the, one of the main beliefs of NLP. The map is not the territory. Um, so yes. for me and what that has been defined of, and obviously this is my perspective of it, right guys? Uh, we create our own map, our own model of the world that may not be the true reality of the territory going on around us there. So if you guys wanna talk about imposter syndrome as William was discussing, right? Um, we might feel like an imposter because we're now playing or acting in this role that doesn't feel like the map, the model of the world that we have created. It doesn't uh, go within the territory that we've designed it in. However, what makes human beings different from animals? It's not our opposable thumbs. Yes, we got opposable thumbs. That's, that definitely is one thing, right? Um, truly though, it's our creative imagination. It's that creative faculty that we have imaginations and that human beings can create things in our minds. We can think it up and we can think these things into existence. There's so many thoughts. Everything around us is start with a thought, this computer, the internet, the phone, everything pretty much in human beings existence started with a thought sometimes, right? So the difference to get back to your question, William, really is just, just to believe, to start with that belief that even if this is not my map, not my model of the world, what, you know, how can I create within all the senses, all the senses that we have, right? You know, my visual, my auditory, my kinesthetic, my gustatory, my olfactory, all of our five senses. How can I make it so real that I believe this is my map, my model of the world right here, right now? And that will challenge your neurology. You know, I made a joke earlier about doing a cold shower to challenge your neurology. People talk about uh, writing with your opposite hand or brushing your teeth to challenge your neurology in a motor skill way. Guys, this experience of going to Malibu with William and putting myself as a $200 million dollar man changed my neurology in a way that was um, extremely empowering and enlightening. And it felt great because all of a sudden I was like, this is how, if I had a $200 million in my bank account right now, this is how I would act. This is the person I would be. 
This is the confidence I would behave with. This is the mindset and the energy that I would portray out with. And as I became that person, I was, I was, as William said, became flexible to became this neurology. I really did see people in the room start to gravitate me toward me in a certain way. They asked me certain questions just to look and I was different. Um, that was my first glimpse into, hey, I can change my own math, my own model of the world. I can change and I can believe that I can, I deserve this change. The process of life, a lot of it is about shredding away of the disbeliefs that we have about our potential. So the fact that someone may feel like an imposter is simply that they're actually on the path of creating a new version of them, right? Because think about it, right? If we want to build a house, we got to have the blueprint, we got to have the design. The house is not there yet, but we have the design. Is the architect an, an imposter? No. Is the home builder or the investor an imposter? No. They believe in an idea and they're going to go create it. Too many people get turned away at that moment, yeah? And they're like, oh, I'm not... I don't have the house yet, therefore I'm not gonna, right? That's why it's a funny thing, right? In real estate, a lot of times buying, you know, selling raw land is different than selling a house because people can envision, well, they don't even have to, they could go see and touch the house. But on the other hand, if you're selling them a piece of land, they have to envision, right? It takes some kind of vision. So what I'm going to encourage you guys, yeah, to do at this point of this interview, I'm gonna ask all of you who are listening, um, I'm gonna ask you to do something. I'm gonna ask you to pick a number that you really want financially. Yeah. And, and I know there are other areas of your life that also are very important. At the same time, the financial energy, the money energy is connected in our lives, right? I mean, you still gotta eat, whatever, right? And, and that money energy is actually a creative energy. So if you, I mean, there are a lot of problems that can be resolved if you simply have a more secure, safe income, maybe abundant income, right? A lot of problems could be. Um, not saying all problems, because you still got to be aware and in charge of your own state inside. Yeah. So long story short, I'm going to ask you to pick a number. All of you who are listening, who you know will be listening, pick a number. Yeah, something that you absolutely do not believe that you can have. Write it down as your goal. But then, instead of focusing on that goal necessarily, I want you to focus on being that person who has that amount in your bank account right now. Tax already paid. So if you pick the number 200 mil, we're talking about taxes all taken care of. You're a law abiding citizen. You're doing all the good things. You have 200, 200 mil in your account, free and clear, like no string attached, it's yours. How would you behave from this moment on? I, I really want you to consider this guys. Like, you know, some people I, I was, I was on, um, I was reading my tech news the other day. Like I love reading tech news. I scrolled down and they were talking about Powerball, right? Lotteries. And they were talking about how many hundreds of million people could win and they're, you know, there are four winners and they're all getting about 200 million, whatever, right? I don't remember the numbers exactly. And I'm like, huh, what would happen if I have X amount in my account right now? How do I, how would I feel and what would I do, right? And when I witnessed, what I witnessed in Malibu that day with Michael was a sense of not only peace and freedom, but there was a sense of total control and personal power. I mean, imagine, really, this is the exercise to get to, there are no unresourceful people, only unresourceful states. Too many of us put ourselves in unresourceful states because we, we have this idea of lack while money's all around us. And then how quickly will you turn that around simply by just imagining you have $200 million or more? It will change everything. Change your beliefs, your, your feelings, your emotions, and sequentially your behavior and your outcome. So I'm gonna give you that challenge. I can tell you all day how awesome it will be and how much you know Michael quickly stepped into that and experienced the magnificence of that feeling, right? That change of identity. I want you to really consider this for yourself and experience it for yourself. Once again, we'll have a, um, we'll have a, you know, we'll have trainings that support you in creating that state, right? Of, of course, our training takes you into that, but let's start there. So Michael, I'm gonna ask you one more question. It's really important. Um, if you were to go back to day one, 
day one, yeah? Um, whatever that means to you. And take what you know now back to day one. Whatever area of your life, doesn't matter, you can choose. Um, and whatever day one means, how would you, how, what would you have done in the beginning? What would you have implemented? What would you have done differently? And it could, it, it, you may say nothing. You may say this, I would do different. But give people big picture answers so that they can also apply. Okay. So hmm. going back, I guess if we're going day one, uh, start of birth. <laughs> nice. Um, let's, let's start there for to give it a time frame, right? So we can work within a time frame. I think I would instill this true belief that vulnerability is power. That being open and having this foundation really of joy and self love and acceptance is power. Um, cause that's one of the truest, biggest learnings that I've gotten from these NLP trainings and my studies is that I'm 100, 100% responsible for this. And that's really my foundation of being responsible for other areas of my life. So just to kind of go back to what you were talking about, about having people, and I, I do encourage you to you guys to do this, find a financial number that challenges your neurology, right? Do it with the vulnerability that you can have this, the acceptance, the self-love, the foundation within there, because that would be my, if I could, you know, quote unquote, go back and talk to myself at day one, I would say, hey, have this acceptance for yourself, that you can be vulnerable, that you have to be closed off. Um, I think when I go back and I do the timeline therapy techniques, that's a big thing that I see within myself that was closed off, a lot of energy, because I looked at vulnerability as a weakness. When it really, it's not, it's just this uh, immense strength to be open, to let that energy in and to use it all as feedback so you can learn from whatever it is that you need to learn from. My learnings have been different and they've shifted. Even if I've gone back in timeline therapy, once learnings that I, I thought I had, they've evolved, right? But it's because I've been vulnerable to get different learnings because I shifted from a failure frame to a feedback frame that I, I've been able to adapt and evolve with these learning. So I think that would be my, uh, my suggestion to anyone who's listening to this right now. You know, do whatever your process is, whatever these techniques are with a very deep foundation of the self-acceptance of joy with love to yourself and be vulnerable to whatever learnings there are out there. Excellent learning, excellent wisdom, I think. You know, because the stronger someone can be, the stronger someone is, the more vulnerable they allow themselves to be. So that's really a true display of strength, a sign of strength. Mm -hmm. Ah, and one thing I would point out too, Michael may be hinting this, uh, and you know, this this is something that you guys want to think about, is that, you know, we, we have a process called parts integration or integration protocol in the training. And what's cool is we integrate you know, part of us or that part of us that feel different, think different into a congruent whole so that instead of feeling conflicted inside or, you know, part of you wants to become more successful and part of you don't think you could, you know, instead of having those parts, you, you, you no longer have those inconsistency. And the reason I bring this up is, let's say you're integrated and you feel totally whole. Being vulnerable to yourself and to others will take you to a whole new level of wholeness because now you're integrating with the world. You're, you're, you're helping the world around you to become more integrated and if, even with you as well. So the oneness, the unity that mankind deserves to have, it you know, becomes more of a reality. And we don't need to get too deep into this. This is a different conversation perhaps for those who have taken the training. Um, but I, I'm going to say this, Michael. So, is there any other things that you suggest the listener, the the viewers, um, what they can do to experience this self love, this vulnerability, this kind of um, self acceptance, right? So that they can be, you know, is it self awareness or like what what is the answer to that? 
Um, the answer, you know, who knows? Uh, my answer, because I, again, I, everything I say, I want to make sure I preference it. It's coming from my perspective, guys, right? Yes. It's, it's my suggestion. It's my idea. So um, a good friend of mine, Michael Huggins, used to say ideas are like pants. You know, try them on. If they fit, great. If not, put them back on the shelf. <laughs> so I still use that. Um, my thing is, guys, anything that triggers you is an opportunity to self-examine, to lean into it, right? So anything in life that triggers me, whether it's someone cutting me off in the car, um, you know, not getting paid on time for a certain thing, anything, uh, you know, a, a date that went the wrong way, I, I, I'm just going to use so many different examples that could happen that's happened to me and it could happen to anyone so anything that happens guys is an opportunity if it triggers you it's an opportunity to self-examine to lean into it to ask yourself you know what is it that i want instead focus on what you want because if it triggers me if it brings up a negative emotion i need to learn from it okay and people and places life is amazing at this, this is again my perspective life is amazing at presenting you with people and opportunities that will give you an opportunity to self-examine um, an area of your life that maybe you need to grow in, that maybe you haven't uh, come to realize and face a mirror, face a reflection, right? So if it triggers you, it's time to look at that reflection, that mirror, uh, self-examine, lean into it. And that's what I do. And that would be my advice. Excellent advice. We, um, I know we, we only got to spend, you know, about 45 minutes here. We, we really only scratched the surface. There's a lot more at the deeper level, a lot more. And um, we do cover this in, in the training on how you face the mirror, how you resolve these things. If anything triggers you, how you get rid of the negative emotions and limiting beliefs that may surface, and then how you can shift your neurology to welcome the new possibilities um, and a number of other things. So we do have a training coming up in February. Uh, one of the weekends, yeah, it's the 13th and the 14th, Saturday, um, starting on the Saturday. We had to switch that last minute to Saturday from Friday. Um, so it's now Saturday and Sunday. Um, we've just been getting a lot of requests for, from people saying their Friday's not open. And um, it's easiest for, I guess, the majority of the people. So Saturday and Sunday, February 13th and 14th. Um, just plan your whole day. Yeah, we're not going to use the whole day, but just plan your whole day if you do intend to attend. Um, anyone who's taken our training is welcome. We're going to have some awesome breakout rooms. Here's the thing. We won't have, like, I mean, we're not going to have, like, hundreds of people in there, so we're going to limit the amount of people that can come still. Um, but it's, yeah, just contact us. There's a post that we wrote. If you say me, you know, um, then we'll, we'll contact you and, and let you know, right, that you're in and stuff um, and send you information. So it is coming up. And if you are interested, um, big picture, sign up immediately because um, what, what you'll want to do is you'll want to go through the online videos um, again if you've already seen it. If not, definitely sign up so that you can watch it immediately and get going so that you can be ready for the practical coming up in in less than a month. So um, any any other, any questions that the audience may have, all of you are welcome to comment and ask. Um, and Michael is our, you know, in-house coach. He will be very, I mean, it will be very valuable for him to be able to speak to you, well, for you guys to be able to speak to him. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out and um, and then we will we'll go from there. So. Michael, any last minute thing that you want to say to the audience? Any other, um, ah, I have a fun question for you. Hmm. Then I think we'll end this. So um, if you were to go to the future, yeah, and ask your future self for advice, ask your future self who has achieved that 200 million or whatever that is, yeah, whatever your goals are, where all of your, your vision board has been, you know, achieved and beyond, uh, what would you ask your future self? Like what, what advice would you ask for? How do I do it right now? <laughs> um, in a way that, it, you know, I wanna learn right now. So if I'm gonna go talk to my future self, 
Um, you know, what I think one of the cool things I've learned from a neuro linguistic programming that change can happen right now. It doesn't have to be slow. It doesn't have to be suffering. It doesn't have to be drawn out. Um, true change can happen right now and immediate good change can happen right now. So I would ask my future self, Hey, what is something that I can go back to go back to myself today and take it back. And then I can change right now to Excel. Um, so that's what I would ask my future self because oh. I, I don't want to, I don't want to wait. You know, I, I don't, I would be say it's kind of like the pink elephant, right? Don't talk, you don't say don't, but I want change right now. I want to evolve right now. So that's what I would ask my future self. That's so key. And it's not even like you're saying, I want the 200 mil right now and all those things. You're saying, I want to be that person who can easily and effortlessly achieve everything you want. That's the key, right? Being that evolved ultimate self. So if everyone had this perspective in this world, we would have so much progress. Less drama, certainly. Yeah, I mean, and that's really what uh, success is, right? We talk about it. I think a good amount of our friends within this community know it, that it's about progress, right? Moving forward in a way that that's success to us. That's progress. You know, change is inevitable. Progress is not guaranteed though. Are you progressing towards what you want? So progressing towards the person you want to be. And if, you know, I'm not saying I can go into the future and talk to myself, I'm not saying I can't either. However, that's what I would want to know. How can I change right here, right now, today to become that person closer to achieve things I want financially, uh, spiritually, with my family, my career, all those things. Yes. You know, it's cool because uh, this is a cool point about the training is that there's a part of the training where we teach you how to utilize what you unconsciously already know about yourself and consciously know about yourself to be able to simulate that future person who's already achieved all these things and then actually extract the programming and reverse engineer into our current day behavior, right? So um, viewers and listeners, if any of you find yourself wanting to have it right now, become the person who can have what you want. And, and, and this is not a guarantee financially. This is a, a invitation for you to truly grow to be the person that you deserve to be. So that being said, um, Michael, thank you for your time today, man. That was very valuable. And um, there's, and for those of you who have already chatted or spoken with Michael, um, hey, keep going. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you will find, a lot of great valuable things that you'll find as you, you know, talk with Michael. And then also, if any of you find yourself wanting to invite your families and friends who you you think will be really benefited from the growth of their mind, right? Their mindset and, and getting rid of their negativity. Um, invite them to speak with Michael and, and invite them into our group. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael, for your time. And uh, we'll talk with you guys later, next time. Till next time.